Hello, Asha. Welcome to the Black Gold Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing very well. So you are uh, an attorney by trade. You went to law school. You also are a teacher and also a speaker. First off, which one did you become first? Which one was your primary vocation? Yeah, well, I think I could say educator probably first, but not because it was my profession first, but because it has always just run through my blood from working with kids. And from the time I can remember, I was able to babysit. I started babysitting then worked at a daycare in college and just kept working with children. And now I teach at the community college level. So educator has been the thread that has carried me through. I would say officially first though, I became an attorney and then started teaching full-time. And I've done you know, speaking engagements here and there, but educator, attorney, speaker. Okay. Uh, and becoming an attorney uh, and being an educator, were there things you were able to take from your educational background into becoming an attorney? Absolutely. I always tell people in general, but also in law, like everything you have done to this point to get you to where you are is useful information. Even if you feel like you have made mistakes or, uh, you know, in college, maybe you feel like you should have chosen a different major. Everything that you have gone through has brought you to this point right here. So um, just thinking about how I would take time to break educational concepts down to students or to kids that I was working with is the same thing that I do with my clients as an attorney, but I just do it on a different level. So really all it is, it's taking some complex piece of information and breaking it down so that anyone can understand it. That's, that's the theme over and over and over again. So in terms of being a speaker, how did that journey begin? Yeah, I mean, first it started with just sharing my own experiences. And I also watched my mom as a speaker. My mom was the first Black woman to enroll and graduate from the University of Mississippi in 1968, I think was when she graduated. She enrolled in 65 and then graduated in three years in 68. And so every school I was at as a kid, she always came and spoke to my classmates and to the school at large about her story. So I watched her just sharing her experience. And then when I got the chance, I started sharing my experience as well. And then, of course, you know, when you're looking for a topic to speak on, you know, speak about something that you know. So whether if it's not personal experience, then it's going to be something you're an expert in. So I talk to business owners about creating businesses. I talk to uh, different groups about becoming leaders and empowering those around them. But those are things that I know, but they're also skills I've developed along the way to actually make me qualified, you know, to share my thoughts and opinions with other people. When speaking to business owners, what uh, questions do they usually have? And also, what do you say to them? Yeah, most folks come to me because of the attorney background for business advice. Do I need to form a business entity? Do I need to write this contract down? What happens if I don't do it? So it's a lot of the, the technical piece of business that's really, really important. And, you know, American society doesn't really like attorneys too much. And the reason for that is because usually attorneys get called in when something's already gone wrong. So I talk to business owners about protecting their businesses. And it's kind of like, you know, going to the doctor for checkups. If you go to your annual physical you're going to catch anything that might be wrong at the beginning stages instead of waiting until, you know, you've got like, I don't know, some problem that you've got to amputate your leg, right? So if you think of business or law as preventative medicine, take care of your business like you should be taking care of your body. And that way you can catch anything before it becomes a problem. And then if you have to do something, make a change, it's not going to be nearly as painful because you've caught it early. Yeah. And also whenever you do that, you then know the process in case you do have an issue or have to deal with some liability and mm -hmm. you know exactly how long things are going to take, how long things are going to be. And you have an idea of what's going to happen. And so it's Absolutely. nothing that, you know, no surprise at, right. at all. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and people are also afraid to, to spend money 
especially in the beginning. And they think that an attorney is going to cost them a whole bunch of money. And, you know, the reality of it is you're going to pay in the beginning or to, you're going to pay for the prevention or you're going to pay twice or four times as much to fix something that could have been fixed. And also like a lot of what I do is just move people out of that scarcity mindset because worrying about the cost, I mean, there, there is a cost and that money is a valid concern, but worrying about it, that it prevents you from taking actions to protect your business is a scarcity thing. And so talk to somebody, get into a group, you know, sign up for the free consultation so you can get the information and then know that any, anything that you get from that attorney, from that CPA, from that business coach is going to be value add to your business. And it's, it's so worth it to pay for the advice up front than for the doctor to fix the problem later. Are there any common mistakes that beginning business owners make whenever having to make legal decisions? As you said, incorporating and having an LLC, are there some other things that people might not know might come up whenever they're starting a business mm -hmm. legally? Yeah, your contracts are really important. So, and just to go back to starting a business entity, a lot of people will decide to wait to form an LLC or a corporation because they don't think they make enough money. And a lot of times accountants, CPAs will say, you know, you don't have to form yet because you're not making enough money. And that's just the tax consideration. That's the money side of it. That doesn't have anything to do with the legal liability side. So one of the protections that an LLC or a corporation gives you is that if there's some trouble and you get sued, then the entity gets sued, the business gets sued, not, your, not you personally. But also there's protection because if you've tried to start this business, you put everything in the name of the business and you decide that you just can't move it forward anymore, you shut down the business and all the debts and liabilities die with the business. So that actually protects you and protects your credit into the future. So you're not paying for this business that didn't work years down the line. So I usually advise people to start a business entity and to work within an accountant and, a, and a, an attorney to figure out what is the right entity for you and your business. Don't just listen to you know, your neighbor down the street because they have different considerations. The other thing is to make sure that you have your agreements written down. So I've seen countless times where people worked with their friends or, you know, they're going to get supplies from a particular person that they like. And, you know, that something happens, life happens, it doesn't come through. And, you know, they have no recourse because they haven't written down an agreement between the two parties. So that even is as much as you would rather not be bothered, just write it down. Even if you just get a standard contract that you can use over and over again with different people, take the time to do that. And the last thing not in any particular order, but a lot of folks mess up with the finances. So when you have a business, you need to separate your business money from your personal money. If you mix the two, it's called commingling. And the IRS code doesn't want you to commingle. The law doesn't want you to commingle. So even if you don't have an LLC or a corporation, you need a separate bank account for your business. And you need separate bank accounts for you as a person. And you need to pay with four business expenses, with the money in the business, and you need to pay for your personal expenses with the money in your personal account. But don't mix the two because then that just sets you up for, it could be disaster. If you get audited, now you have to justify what really is a business expense. And if you've tried to write something off, it doesn't make sense. You can't prove you don't have the receipt, then you're paying all that money back and then penalties, of course, to the IRS as well. Yeah, and it's also important even for yourself to keep track of, you know, profit versus losses and also mm -hmm. everything that you have in terms of expenses, as you said, for IRS purposes. Right. So you said starting out in order to get things going smoothly, financially speaking, you should have an attorney and also an accountant to look over your mm -hmm. your records. So for the accountant, apart from, as you said, commingling your income and also taxes, what else can the accountant do in order for us to have a better optimized business? Yeah. So you don't necessarily need an accountant for this piece of it. You could have a bookkeeper, but an accountant can certainly set you up too. If they do this, they will set. they should set you up in either QuickBooks or FreshBooks or some kind of accounting software. Or if you're using a spreadsheet, even if it's not in the bookkeeper, find some kind of program or software or spreadsheet that you can use to keep track 
of the different categories of income, the different categories of expenses. And, and you want an expert to get you set up with that because those categories were transferred directly to the tax return. My first few years in business, I didn't realize that. And, and I got a CPA to help me file my business taxes, but I had changed the categories in QuickBooks to stuff that I thought would, and it made sense for my business. And then at the end of the year, the CPA spent so much time going back through the things that I had classified because they weren't the classifications on the IRA, you know, on the tax return. And I didn't know that. So I ended up, you know, spending, paying her to go back through it. When, if I would have just got set up correctly from the beginning, I would have known not to touch those categories, but a CPA is really important because they will educate you on. And if they're not, you need to find someone who will educate you on what kind of things you can write off. What strategically should you do so you can take advantage of the IRS code, the tax code and run as many things as possible through your business. But they should also let you know, because a lot of folks say, you know, their, their strategy is to just not have to pay taxes and they, so they want to write everything off. But you got to look four or five years down the road, because if you have an LLC and you're, you've said for the last three years that the LLC hasn't made money, which personally on your taxes, like that looks great for you. But now you want to go and buy a house. You want to go and take a loan, but your business on paper has never made any money. Even though you funded your lifestyle, your business has never made any money. That can come back and hurt you later because a lender is going to say, you're not making anything. You have, your expenses are just as high as your income. You're not a good risk for us. So it's important to get with the experts who can help you think through your path and where you want to go in your future and give you advice based on that. Because a lot of people will think about what right now, I don't want to pay taxes today and I don't want to pay taxes tomorrow. But in five years, maybe you're ready to purchase a property or two years, but you haven't built up that paper trail and you won't be able to do it. So get with someone who can help you think about the global picture. Okay. So you want someone to, you want a, a CPA to help you with your taxes and also with managing, helping you manage your accounts, business versus personal, mm -hmm. make, sure that, make sure that they have, you know, all the records of everything that you needed expenses and stuff you can write off. Okay. What is a, a write-off? Yeah. So a write-off is, is, so I'm not a CPA, but I'm going to give you my best understanding and definition of, of a write-off. So it is something that is in the IRS code, in the tax code that says it is a business expense. And so it will either be not taxable or it will reduce your tax liability because you're not paying taxes on it. So office space, for example, and a lot of people in COVID are now working from home. And if you have your own business and you're using a room just for your office, you could calculate the amount of rent or mortgage that you're paying for that space in particular. And then it co counts as a business expense that becomes non-taxable. So it, it reduces your tax liability because you're having to pay for this thing. Or like your cell phone, if you are using your cell phone to do business or the, the Wi-Fi bill, or let's say you're a personal trainer and you need new clothes to, to do your job as a personal trainer. Those are all things that help you do your business. So those expenses have to be, I believe the technical, like the phrasing is necessary and ordinary for your business to run your business, but those get counted as business expenses. And sometimes, and in the tax code, you can write them off, meaning not pay taxes or have a reduction in taxes. And sometimes like local cities, I think will, you know, like I know California multiple times or Oakland, California multiple times said, if you're going to hire someone, we're going to give you a write off. We're going to give you some tax credit, some tax benefit for hiring new people. So it's really important to get with those tax advisors who work with business owners so they can help you take advantage of all of the offerings that the IRS code has to offer you. So does the write-off, is it supposed to be an encouragement for people to uh, start their own businesses within, within America in terms of having that as an incentive to go ahead and start a business, have a, yeah. an economy within the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, some people are certainly motivated by the write-offs, but I think that the Internal Revenue Code, the tax code, 
it benefits business owners. So first it benefits corporations and then LLCs and then sole proprietors and not as much. And then, you know, it really doesn't help employees very much at all. But the reason why it rewards corporations is because in theory, these businesses, whether it's big or small, are helping to employ other people. You know, we're talking about the economy crashing after COVID because businesses were closed. And so you can see the importance, how important it is to have businesses that employ people. And so the government wants to keep the businesses open because then that keeps money in the pockets of the people and then that helps the economy to go around. So, you know, whether or not businesses deserve as much of a tax break as they get, that's a whole other discussion. But if you were running a business as a sole proprietor, really think hard about forming a legitimate business entity so you can take advantage of some of the same tax benefits that these big corporations like Walmart take advantage of. You know, it's, it's stuff that we don't normally know in the black and brown community, but when you get the resources around you to help you when they're experts, you will be able to take advantage of the same things that Amazon takes advantage of, that Facebook takes advantage of. It might not be on the same scale, maybe one day it will, but there are still benefits to being a legitimate business owner. You talked about the the pandemic, about COVID-19. How has that uh, impacted the way that you do your business um, in terms of legal matters and also in terms of your own personal life? Well, I turned my law firm into a virtual law firm probably five or six years ago at this point because my goal was to run a business in California, but to be anywhere in the world. So to run my California business from anywhere. And my my plan was to move abroad, work in another country and still have legal cases in California. And so for me, the pandemic didn't really change the way that I did business. It changed the way that some of my clients did business though, excuse me, especially if they had a brick and mortar location. And I think it also just underscores the need to be diverse in the way that we deliver whatever product or service we're delivering. So you can have a brick and mortar store or meet with people in person, but I think that there should also be a sufficient online platform as well, so that if the store gets closed, you can stay online, or if the internet shuts down, you can still do business, you know, in person if you need to. So it's really underscored the need to be diverse in the way that we deliver. I will say though, that even though it didn't change the way I delivered services for me, between teaching at the community college and doing the law practice, I felt like I was at my desk for a million hours a day. And I would be there from the time I would get up at 6.30 or seven o'clock in the morning. And then the next thing I knew it would be dark at eight o'clock and I'd still be sitting at my desk. And that was absolutely terrible. So I had to learn. And then I would, you know, I'd eat dinner and I'd go to bed and get up and do the same thing, you know, on repeat. And it, it, there just wasn't enough distinction through throughout my day from, you know, transitioning from one thing to the other. So what I have done now is I promised myself that I will be done by five o'clock in the evening. And I give myself a little bit of time in the morning because I realized without the chain, without having to leave the house, you know, without being able to go out and socialize, I had to really make sure that I imposed those boundaries for myself so I could give my brain a break. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that in terms of making time to do things that you want to do rather than having to be at your desk all day. Mm -hmm. Like last year, I was doing classes online. And it was, you know, wake up early for morning classes at your computer, you know, you have to do assignments and then you, as you said, wake up, you, you wake up and you're mm -hmm. in a stuck outside and you'd like missed an entire day. You missed yep. a beautiful, you know, sun. And also you are just at your computer all day long, you're doing stuff for, you don't know yeah. how long <laughs> it takes. Totally. And it's like, did I, yeah. And so you like lose track of time, lose track of just, just being. And so also, that's very important, as you stated, to make sure you take time to do things, uh, you know, go outside, play, mm -hmm. have fun, and do things in such a way that you have a, a balance in terms totally. of what you, you work and also mm -hmm. uh, your, your play time. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. 
So you mentioned your mother being an influence in your teaching and also in the way that you deliver whenever you speak. Uh Uh, Has there been anyone else in your life that's been a a mentor figure in terms of helping you both with with law school and also with your other endeavors? Yeah, I, I, of course, I won't be able to think of any just off the top of my head, but I have, when I was in school, especially law school, they taught us how to network and they taught us the power of building those relationships and authentic relationships. And there's a lot of people who don't build authentic relationships, but I think because, because of the authenticity, I was able to connect myself and be under the wing of people who had my best interest at heart, who would support me. The first firm that I went to downsized and I was one of the first people to get let go because I was one of the last people hired. And just with my friend, when I was thinking about doing family law She has a background in family law. She's like, okay, here's the information you need. Here are the documents that we use in court. Like, here's how you get started, right? From something as tangible as that to just encouraging me when I studied to take the bar. Or even now, my law practice is not a traditional law practice because I have this membership community that really focuses on on the law, but also business coaching, really educating entrepreneurs. And my attorney friends, there aren't any other attorneys doing what I'm doing. And so when I was asking my attorney friends, a lot of them were like, I don't think you can do that. You can't do that. No other attorney has ever done that. And so I had to reach out to another entrepreneur community that wasn't, we're really restricted as attorneys in terms of what we can and cannot do. And, you know, just by the whole practice of law, if it hasn't been done before, it probably can't be done. Or if, you know, there's like, there's some case that says what you can and cannot do. And so we're not trying to start new things as, a, as attorneys, but as an entrepreneur, we're doing the exact opposite. We yeah. are not afraid of risk. We're not afraid of growth. And so I had to get around other people. I have a really good um, friend who's a CPA and we talk about, we live right around the corner from each other. We go on walks and talk about business. I've joined a couple of business communities where there's a whole bunch of different entrepreneurs that are out there. So you got to find your mentors wherever you connect with people. And it's good to have them in your industry, but it's also good to have them outside of your lane too, because that'll just help expand your mind and help you to grow in ways that maybe people in your industry haven't thought about growing. Yeah. So in doing so, you must have come up with a lot of difficulties in terms of both getting clients with your new method and also with other attorneys how did you deal with that how did you overcome that that struggle i would say that the the difficulty is in trying something new so anytime you know once you get to a certain age uh, most people don't try new things anymore when you're a kid you're constantly learning new stuff and you constantly kind of suck at it and then have to get better at it right and that just yeah. kind of comes with the territory You know, as an adult, it is much more uncomfortable to be uncomfortable. We we have this feeling like we should just have it all figured out. We're grown now. We graduated school. We have the skill. We're not supposed to have this this doubt or like feeling like we don't have mastery over the subject. But as an entrepreneur, you're constantly learning something new. So for me, this switch to my membership community is okay, now I need to understand how do I get clients for this? Whereas when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, if I'm going to form their business for them, my messaging is a little bit different. It's a very particular audience, you know, and it doesn't really matter what they do. As long as they need an LLC or corporation, I can help them out. For this membership community, I'm looking specifically for black and brown entrepreneurs who already have a business, you know, so that they're, and if they don't have a business, they're starting one as we speak, because the things that I am teaching are things you can implement right away. So if you haven't figured out what you want to do for your business yet, you're not the, you're not my ideal client. There's probably some stuff that I have that can help you, but I got to figure out how to talk to that new person who's my new target audience. And then what ways, like, where are they? Are they on Instagram? Are they on LinkedIn? How do they want me to talk to them? So it's like, it's like, um, I'm dating somebody new, right? That's my client is somebody new. So I knew how to date the other client. Now I got to figure out how to date this, this new client. Yeah. And so you said over the course, you've been virtual for, for six years, correct? Mm-hmm. So what tools and resources did you have at your disposal six years ago? And what tools and resources do you have now that you have been using to 
both create and build your current business model? Yeah. So back six years ago, I had a, a voice over IP phone, which is kind of the standard now, like you can't get a yeah. landline, but that was, you know, not 100% new, but newer. Yeah. So that meant I could have an app on my phone. I could have the app on my computer. I could be at my mom's house. I could be, you know, I guess not actually on a plane, but I could be in an airport and it would ring the same way, right? With just a Wi-Fi connection. So that really freed up my location, gave me location independence. Also virtual offices were becoming a thing. So I have an office address, but someone else checks the mail and then I go and pick it up, you know, a couple of times a week. So that has really helped. Now, right before the pandemic started, I, I started using Zoom for my client consultations because I had been on a few Zoom consultations with people that I was looking to hire for services, and it just changed the dynamic. It's nice to talk to someone on the phone, but when you actually get to see someone and develop a rapport, you get to get a feel for them, they get a feel for you, and that sale at the end or like the engagement becomes easier because you just have more points of contact, right? You, get, you have yeah. more familiarity with the video. So started using that. Even just ways to share documents. A lot of times now we use Google Docs when I'm editing a contract for somebody, when I'm doing a review, you know, now I'll say, just put it in Google Docs. You can still email a Word document, but what's fabulous about Google Docs, despite formatting sometimes challenges, is that you can see the edits in real time and you can make those suggestions. And I don't have to keep track of the latest version and make sure I've sent the latest version. All of the software for case management is online. That was online back then too, back, you know, six years ago, but it was that just the beginning of putting these things online. Whereas before you used to have to have a disc or download, you know? So now I think it's really easy to be online. And actually once I told my clients, you know, let's meet by email or by phone, they were actually really happy because most business owners are busy. So to drive to my downtown Oakland office, find parking, meet with me for 30 minutes to an hour. You know, it's like yeah. two hours out of their day. They would rather sign into Zoom and get what we need done in 20, 30 minutes. They can go back to work. Yeah, virtual meetings are a huge time saver in terms mm -hmm. of, as, as you said, especially in California, finding parking. Right. right? Like that's a <laughs> happy day right there. And so Seriously. it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that's a really, a really good advantage to having virtual meetings. Were there any books that you read either both in law school and also now that have informed you on what you do business-wise or even personally? Yeah. So, okay. One of, the, one of the books that I read most recently or more recently is called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. And it talks about these, I think it's four areas, the zone of competence, zone of... Mm, zone of excellence, zone of genius. And there's one more, I think there's one more on the other side of zone of competence. So the idea behind the book though, is to really learn and understand what your zone of genius is. So what are those things? What are those things that you are really, really good at that are effortless for you, require minimal effort that are really exciting, but you're also really skilled at. And the idea is to do just those things. And you can build a business doing just those things. And how do you do that? You plug the other people around you who are in their zone of genius. So for me, my zone of genius is educating, taking complicated concepts and making them smaller and it's connecting people. I am not a money person. So I don't need to be doing the books for my business. I don't need, you know, analyzing the data. I need to hire someone to do that or put someone around me who their zone of genius is in analyzing the data, looking at my numbers in QuickBooks and telling me like, this is what we should do based on that. So that's really helpful because I think you know, when you start out as an entrepreneur, you end up doing a lot of things because you're building out your business. You should know how to do the things in your business, but also you just can't afford to hire everybody that you need in the very beginning. Yeah. So, but once you can afford, hire those people to shine in their zone of genius and you stay in your lane and then watch yourself grow. So Gay Hendricks, The Big Leap, what is another one? I read The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, but I read it too early in my career. But the principle, <laughs> the prin this principle stayed with me. So Tim Ferriss had started this supplement company and he was the, the CEO of it. And he found himself on emails like 16 hours a day, just answering mundane questions. He hired a 
customer service company. And that took him down to about eight hours a day of emails. And then once he analyzed the data, he realized most of his time, he was giving permission for customer service agents to like charge back $10 or to make a $10 adjustment. So he said, if you can handle this issue with the customer and it doesn't cost, cost the company more than $10, do it. The customer service agent has the authority to do it. And that freed up most of his time. And so that lesson there is kind of like the zone of, of genius is to, to not be the, the stopping point in your business. Like don't be the chokehold in your business. So empower the people around you to make the decisions and build up your team so that your capacity is not limited by just you as one person. Give other people capacity as well. And then there was another one I was going to mention and what, what, oh, profit first. I'm in the middle of reading that. And I think that is really important for new entrepreneurs. I say that earlier you can read it, read it. And that talks about learning how to pay yourself first. And especially my mission is to help black and brown business owners build a business, but then also leave a legacy. So build your business, make lots of money, and then decide what you're going to do with the money, whether it's investing in yourself, investing in your kids, selling the, you know, whatever, right? And Profit First talks about how to make sure you are actually getting paid from your business because so many of us work really hard in our businesses, which is awesome, but we don't ever pay ourselves. So it's not any better financially for us than it is working for somebody else. And you're going to work harder in your own business than you are working for somebody else. So it's, it's learning those strategies to make sure that you get what you want out of your business and profit first is a really good book for that yeah and also you mentioned the four hour work week mm -hmm. and that's a really good book also for as you said finding things that other people can do that take up a lot of your own time when you can be actually doing something else if you wanted mm -hmm. to also, yep. another one that's in that same vein is the uh, the E Myth Revisited, uh -huh. and it's that same idea that you know you create a system, you let that system work for you, and then what you do is you, you know just let it run it let it run its own, it runs right. by itself, and so then mm -hmm. that way you're able to do what you need to do. It stuff happens, you know, pretty much automatically. You have no big surprises. You can tweak it as you want to along the way. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are really good, good book picks. Definitely. Yeah. Is there anything that you've been doing recently that you'd say has changed the lives of people? Yeah, I think every time I'm talking about using our businesses to build wealth, I think it is definitely changing the lives of people. I mean, I, I've definitely formed over 50 businesses, so that has that has certainly changed the lives of folks. But what I'm hearing about lately is just the messaging behind, you know, this is an opportunity for you as well. I tell people all the time, there's nothing in your history that counts you out of being able to be an entrepreneur and start your own business. It is the great equalizer. We could use it as a tool for social justice, for economic justice. In this country, money talks. And if you don't have the money, you just don't really have a voice. But guess what? We have skills. And this weekend was the 100th anniversary of the massacre in Tulsa, Tulsa right? Yeah. yeah. And in Tulsa, we called it Black Wall Street because it was this whole community of Black entrepreneurs and people living in community. And so we have done it before, multiple times. Post-slavery, Black folks had all the skills and were starting businesses and it got uncomfortable for white folks. And so they started the Jim Crow laws, the segregation laws. So repeatedly throughout history, when we have come together in our own communities, we have built things and we have been profitable and we have changed our lives. And then when we get too big, there's some kind of legislation or genocide really that pushes back against our communities. And unfortunately, a lot of folks today, we don't know our history because it just hasn't been passed down orally. They're not teaching it in schools, you know, but once, when you know your history, especially as an African-American person in this history, in this country, and it's not all negative. We have some really, really good qualities. We have some really like standout strengths behind us. And I think when we tap into that power, we know that we can do it again. So 
just the message that I'm sharing now is one about empowerment, that you have whatever it takes to change your life, whether it's just a side hustle to make a little bit of extra money and to use that money to save up for retirement so you don't have to work until 67. Maybe you can retire at 50. That'll change your life, right? Maybe it's starting a business just so you can pay your children and it's non-taxable what you pay to your kids and they can use that money either for spending money or they can invest it into their own retirement account and there's a special account for kids who are under the age of 18 or you can take that money and invest it in college education so there are tools that are available that aren't that difficult to access but the information the experts can be hard to access when we don't have those role models in our community so my mission right now is to make that information available to share it as far and wide as I can and just to empower people to make their own decisions because we've got the skill now we're just going to be more strategic about what we're already doing to get to where we want to be financially. Exactly. Yeah. People, black people have, you know, created tremendous works of art, music, tremendous breakthroughs within the sciences. And so it's the idea of, as, as you said, we have the ability, we have the skill, we just need to have a way to get it out there and need to market it and again yep. in, in a way that people would acknowledge both mm -hmm. what we have done and also what we can then go on to do right and and also normalizing ownership so you know i just remember you know with with prince the conversation around his catalog or even just artists we talk about right yeah. and how could this person be broke when their song was number one for the past 15 weeks but Traditionally, artists don't own their own catalog. They don't own their own music, but Prince really made sure that he owned his own catalog. And I think Michael Jackson did the same thing. I know India Ari left her record label because she didn't like the direction that they were making her go. And so she just waited out her contract and then started making money for herself. The verses that happened a few weeks ago between Earth, Wind and Fire and the Isley Brothers. Yeah. Um, there was a story about how it was an earth, wind and fire song that a snippet, a snippet got played at one of the Super Bowls. And one of the earth, wind and fire guys said to his brother, did they pay us for that song? And they said, I don't think so. And yeah. they called up their agent or the attorney or whoever it was and got cashed out because they owned the rights to that song and it was used without their permission. And even if it was going to be permitted to use, someone would still have to pay them for their creative genius. But you gotta protect yourself legally. You gotta own your stuff legally. You gotta have copyrights and trademarks and patents if that's necessary, because that's how things are protected in the US. And so we want, we've got the talent, we've got the goals, but now we need to learn how to use the tools that are available to us so that we can make what's ours, keep what's ours, and then sell it if you want to, but you know, do whatever you want with the money you are you are earning from that, but it only happens when you have ownership. Yeah, what are your thoughts on creating digital products versus physical products, and which one do you think has a better return on investment? Do both. You know why not do both? <laughs> I, I think it depends yeah. also on you know what the business is and what makes sense for you. But that's what I talk about with my entrepreneurs. I focus mainly on service based entrepreneurs, so. I'm an attorney, my service is I can form your business, right? I can do it one-on-one -on -one, and that's the traditional way that it's gonna be. And I'm gonna charge you a flat rate for it. A way to diversify or to digitize it is that I created a video course for someone to walk through to learn how to form their own LLC. So it's the same things, like I literally formed an LLC recorded my screen and walked people through the steps. So I'm telling them what to do as they're doing it. And I sell that for a certain price. It's, it's the same service delivered now in a digital format. They don't get me live, but they get me on video. So that's a digital format. And then I could write an ebook about how to form your own LLC. Right. So that gives people three different options at three different price points. And it also means that if I get sick, and can't meet with you in person, I have another opportunity for someone to work with me. And the best thing about it is that digital products become passive income because someone can download it at 3 a.m. while you're asleep and you wake up to a notification that someone's paid for your book, for your course, downloaded your music while you were sleeping. Like, how cool is that? You know, <laughs> if you have to work all the time for your money, you're going to have to keep working for your money. But if you can set up ways 
to take what you do as your service, your product and put it online so that someone can download it or purchase it to create that passive income. That's where it's at. Yeah. So you said do both, create both the physical and the digital product. So in, in doing those two things, which one in your opinion do you think should be done first or should they both be done simultaneously? So I think it depends on what it is. So if you are service-based business, I would say probably start with the in-person service or like the live service and okay. get really good at it. So you can decide what do you actually need to put in that digital product? So we learn best um, by doing it over and over and over again. So it took a while, took a couple of years for me to actually put my course the LLC formation videos online because I was still refining the process and getting efficient. And once I was like, okay, this is it, nailed it. Like, let me teach someone else how to do this. If it is something tangible, like a good. So I know that there are some planners I've ordered in the past and they have an option to download a digital copy of the planner, the planner pages that you can print out on your own or you can buy one that's bound and will get shipped to you. And I've downloaded the digital copy before thinking like, oh, okay, I'll just save some money. But then I had to go print it. Then I had to go figure out how to bind it. And I was like, you know what? Let me just get the, the full product. Inbound version, yeah. Yeah, but it did, the download did allow me to see what the pages look like. It allowed, allowed me to get the experience. So I didn't have to make that huge investment before. But that is a really good way to like to use as a lead magnet you know, or to use to allow people to become more familiar with your product before you ask them to actually purchase. And it doesn't mean that you have to put the whole thing online, but maybe you just give a couple pages away, you know, and then they get familiar with you and comfortable with you and will buy the uh, tangible product. It's also much easier to put a digital product online. It's much cheaper to do that. So maybe when you're starting, that's a good way to test the market. Is this something that people actually want from you? Do you need to change it? You, it's really easy to change it to the digital product. If you have printed, you know, 800 planners and you don't have traction for them, well, now you got 800 planners that you got to move. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And also it's a better return on investment if you also mm -hmm. were to do it online. Because as you said, there's nothing, no inventory for you to handle in terms of right. anything you have to offload. Mm -hmm. And you have income rather than having any debt or any loss at all right. in your product right. from it not succeeding or, or not taking it off in the way that mm -hmm. you want it to. Right. And there are other ways to, I mean, I, I know that there's drop shipping that I don't totally understand, but that you could have, you know, a product in there, but it gets made every time someone orders. So there are ways to not carry inventory. And then depending on what your price point is, if the planner costs you $20 to make, then you better price it at a way that actually makes you a profit. Whereas with the download, you make it once and you sell it over and over again. So you're probably going to have higher profit margins, but maybe you can move 20 planners and make a profit of, you know, $50 on each. That might be a good ROI for you, depending on what kind of business you have and whether you enjoy making the process of making the planner. If you're like, nope, I'm all digital. I'm that digital expert. Let me stay over here. Yeah. What are your thoughts on both creating methods of passive income and also what should you do while you're waiting for those different avenues to start giving you income? Yeah, I think just like dream big in terms of what your streams passive income could be, you know, and take something that you are already doing and see how can you turn it into something passive. So if you're not already in business, think about something that you know and that you like, you know, that you love to do. And how can you teach somebody else how to do it? Or I don't know, maybe it's earrings that you put on the website or some kind of jewelry, right? And they and they your your active part is making it, but then when you put it online, you know, people are buying it. I don't know if that technically counts as passive income, but that's still using it's not a digital product, but it's still using technology, right? To not have to be there to make the sale in real time. So find something that you enjoy, find something that you really know how to do, and then, you know, teach somebody. That's essentially what it is. And then there are also ways, you know, you could do other things for passive income, like Amazon has links for sellers. So 
if I create an Amazon, I don't know if it's a seller's account. I can't remember what it's called, but if I post about the big leap book and I, I could get a special URL for that big leap book. And then anyone who clicks on that URL for my website or uses my link, they buy the book. It's the same for them, but then I get a percentage of the sale, right? Yeah, so Amazon some, affiliates. Yeah, yeah. Right. And there are other ways to be affiliates too. So if you're a CPA, or you're a bookkeeper, you know, set up your affiliate account with QuickBooks or FreshBooks so that anytime you're setting up a new customer, they're paying for it, but you get some benefit from them doing it. Or if you are, I don't know, working at a gym and you're a college student, like maybe you can have a discount or there's a referral, $50 referral for every new client that you sign up or every new client that comes in from using your name. So think about, you know, what do you like to do, but also what relationships do you have? And how could they be mutually beneficial? You can leverage them so you get some, you know, some kickback or like a referral fee or some passive income for stuff that you're already doing. Okay. So you make sure that you, you know, have your system in place, you have your product, your service or whatever. You do that thing first, you know, mm -hmm. in person, you know, one-on-one, -on -one. then you can even, you can even record that session and then... Uh -huh you know, outsource that, put it online and have other people purchase that as a product itself, if you want yeah, to, yeah, or then absolutely. refine that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are your thoughts on influencers in terms of having them promote your product or your service? Yeah. So it's kind of like having an affiliate in a, in a way, right? I mean, it's essentially what it is. I think that it could be really useful, but you also want to make sure that the, the person that you're using as the influencer is really going to give your business credibility. So I have a good friend of mine who has like all these hundreds of thousands of followers and is really big in fashion. And, and I was thinking, hmm, she has a really big platform. Would it be like, could I ask her to repost something that I have? And I could ask her, but she's not in the entrepreneurship world like I am. So her audience is different. So it's not actually going to be useful for me to ask my friend to repost something for me because it's a completely different audience, right? So, you know, just be careful because then your product also becomes tied to their influence. So, you know, like if you get a celebrity, you know, celebrities, they're loved one day, hated the next day. So now if your brand is tied up with them, you know, you have to, it could be great benefits, but it also could be some downfall too. But I would say probably the most beneficial folks, not necessarily influencers, but are the, those like adjacent services. So for me as an attorney, I'm constantly referring people to CPAs, to the accountants to get, you know, so they can have their conversation and together we can figure out what the best business entity is. So for my membership program, I have done affiliate links for the CPAs who have clients and they're like, the clients are asking them about business, like, oh, no, no, no. You got to go to Asha because she actually knows about what entity to form. And so that has actually been really, really helpful and really useful because they're already the people in the right audience. They're using another service and they also need my service. Okay. So you create your own network based mm -hmm. on your target market and then you find someone who appeals to that market and have them then promote your product as you said like an affiliate right exactly yeah the key is to leverage you know an audience that you're not already tapped into but make sure that the person you're using is credible is reliable and is actually talking to your potential customers otherwise it's, it's you know like great you get more eyes on it but really you want people yeah. to buy your product so you got to make sure that you're really tapping into the right audience exactly okay so you're also a, a speaker. What topics do you speak about? And also in the, the business space, what are your thoughts on new legislation regarding taxes? Okay. So when I speak, I speak to a lot of business owners about business opportunities, but, and also to a lot of college students about just making it through college. And every theme throughout there is, you know, figure out who you want to be, what you want to do, chart your own path, stick to it. It's hard no matter what. Like, I feel like the biggest, maybe not lie we were told, but the biggest omission that we were told as kids is that, or, you know, we, <laughs> parents weren't exactly forthcoming about how hard adulthood can be sometimes. And, 
you know, there's this, especially with this instant culture and social media, you feel like you're supposed to have made it. But entre entrepreneurship, life in general is a constant relearning. It's you're constantly learning something, mastering a new skill, growing, changing. Like there isn't anything that stays stagnant about life. And I just remember realizing, I don't know how many years ago, I was like, man, it's not going to stop. So, <laughs> but once you realize that it's not going to stop, then you just kind of roll with the punches. Like, yeah, there's going to be some ups. There's going to be some downs. That's just this journey that we're on called life. So I talk to folks about a lot of those things, about leadership, empowerment. Yeah, bringing your full self to the table and like bring everything that you are, your quirks, your idiosyncrasies, your big, loud laughter, your quiet nature, bring everything that you are, your past, your present, your future, bring it to what you do, because all of you belongs to be here doing whatever is deserves to be here doing whatever it is that you want to do. And then the second question was about new legislation around business and taxes, you know, <laughs> I don't know exactly what all the new legislation is going to be. I do think that there definitely needs to, to be some evening out in terms of the tax responsibility. One, I think that while the taxes favor the business owners, we need to learn how to take advantage of those the tax code, right? Like we talked about earlier in this episode. We need to learn how to take advantage of that. At the same time, we need some reform for the lower class and especially the middle class on taxes because it's a disproportionate burden and that's not fair at all. I am in favor of paying taxes. That's how so many things get funded. Every time I hit a pothole, <laughs> I realize it's because my tax dollars didn't go in to fill that hole, right? But that's what we are paying for, We're paying for those services. And then just having spent time abroad, like in the Netherlands, I think it's something like 45% of individual taxes goes back to the state. And people say, yeah, it's a lot, but it doesn't really bother them that much as a whole because the services they get from the state are so robust. There's enough housing for everyone. Healthcare is free or affordable. Education, even college education is, I, I think I was there a long time ago, but like it was $7,000 total for four years of college, right? I couldn't even, I mean, I could buy books for $7,000, but you know, my, uh, my total education career, my books have probably cost over $7,000, just the books, right? Yeah. Not even sitting in the classroom. So I don't think it's so much that I think, you know, the tax burden or responsibility needs to be redistributed, but I am in favor of, you know, having some social support. I mean, it's done good things in France. It's done good things in Europe. You could be socialist and capitalist at the same time, you know, so we need some reform. I'm not all the way for, all the way against, but I'll look at each policy individually and then make my vote. Decision there. on that, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You talked about learning more and learning more things about your business. Have you learned anything that's not in your niche that you found to be applicable to your own business strategy? Hmm. Well, I think as an entrepreneur, you know, you're constantly learning stuff. So I had to learn how to market. I went to business school four or five years after law school, and I thought it would be more helpful than what it really was. But I realized that having run my own business, I actually knew a lot about business. So, you know, there are things from like how to talk to people, how to book events that don't have anything with, to do with me actually delivering the service that I have gone to school to learn how to deliver, but they are important parts of learning how to run the business. I challenged myself this past month or past six weeks because I started, you know, gym started to open back up. And so there was a new boxing gym right around the corner from my mom's house. So I was visiting my mom for the past six weeks and I decided to, to take up boxing. And generally speaking, I'm, I'm sort of ambidextrous. So I write left-handed but usually I play sports with my right hand and basketball I used to go to my left more. I open doors with either hand, but you know, I just kind of take on whatever position I get put in when I'm being coached. So the coach was right-handed. And so I started boxing right-handed and I said, you know what, I'm going two days a week. Let me switch it up. Let me do Tuesdays left-handed, you know, Thursdays, right-handed. And then I said, you know what, let me just do it all left-handed. Let me develop this skill, this, this thing that feels so unnatural and uncomfortable because normally I'm playing sports right-handed and let me just be patient with myself and develop the skill and the strength to become proficient boxing left-handed. Now I'm not getting in the ring with anybody. Like I'm hitting a bag and that's it. I'm not ducking anybody's punch. If I got hit, I'd probably just fall out. I'd just lay down and 
you know, and give up. Right. But it's just, it's allowing my brain, it's challenging my brain to comprehend something differently. Even most of the instructors, they still demonstrate on the right side. So when I'm looking at them and I'm trying to flip it back the other way to see what I need to do. And I'm just doing that for myself to build the resilience, to build, the, keep the elasticity in my brain for learning something new, for reminding myself that it's okay to be uncomfortable and that soon I will be proficient and I will be just as fine as if I was naturally born left-handed, you know? So that's a little, a little fun challenge that is, uh, totally unnecessary, but enjoyable nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, it, it is very interesting what you can pick up and you can then take to your core discipline by doing different odd things. One thing, this is before, before COVID. I haven't done it since COVID, but I would go hunting. Mm -hmm. And uh, going hunting, you're usually just sitting there. At least the method that, that I use is I, I sit like by, by a tree or something and I would wait mm -hmm. and I'd look through the scope for the different animals, for the uh, hunting deer, sort mm -hmm. of deer or hog. And in, in doing so, what you'd see is that you get to notice the different layers of, of the foliage of so the trees, mm -hmm. one tree from the other, the distance between them, the rocks that's in the middle and in, in between them. And so it's the idea of you can see the animal between those two layers and also mm -hmm. it takes you it takes time to adjust to notice if it's actually there or not because you've mm -hmm. been waiting for it to be there right and you then in a way you hallucinate the animal being there you see uh -huh, it there uh -huh. and then when it's really there you're like is it really there right I'm right right that is there and so it's this idea of you know you you have to wait you have to be patient you have to look at the different layers and see that there's something there, even you want it to be there. Is it really there? Once it's there, you know, make sure that you you, you take the shot and follow through. Mm -hmm. um, but I've only gotten one deer, like in the, in the entirety of, of hunting for over five years. So, uh -huh. uh, but it's really fun. Just like watch, be outside, look at things, look at the animals. Right. And you get to learn a lot of stuff from just observation not mm -hmm. even it's not like you you're sitting reading a book but also just observing things in natural life yeah. you see how like people shop in a grocery store what do they go yep. for mm -hmm. do they go for staple items or do they go for you know the junk food chips and, and drinks and stuff like that right and so it's this idea of you know like what's there what's around me and what can I learn from what's around me and apply it to what I do every single day? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really yeah. like that. I mean, we don't talk about observation enough, but it is a really, really useful tool to have as a business owner, as a person, you know, in leadership, like just, just be quiet for a minute and just take a look at what's going on around you and, and yeah. study people, you know, learn how they move. Like you said, learn what they buy and why. And if you're a business owner and entrepreneur, that's going to help you figure out how to talk to your ideal client. What do they like to do and how do they act and what are their pain points and, you know, what are they excited about? So just sit back and observe. We don't have to say that much. I feel like I'm using a lot of words today, but we don't have to say that much. You know, we can just sit back and observe. Yeah. Well, Asha, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation that we had. One more question for you, and that is, uh, if you had the ability to send the worldwide text, what would your message be? It would be act in love. And I have it on, on this necklace. I had it engraved as a reminder to not just myself, not just to treat others in love or to act towards others in love, but to act in love towards myself. That I want us as a world, as a community of people to do things out of love, not out of fear, not out of hate, not out of frustration, but be the most loving of ourselves as we can and just watch how the world changes. That doesn't mean you have to like everybody. Doesn't mean you don't set boundaries, but you know, talk to people with love, move with love, just be love. And I think things will really change. Well, Asha, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Uh, where can the listeners go to like listen to more of you or to discover more about your work? Absolutely. So I hang out primarily on Instagram and my handle over there is Asha Wilkerson ESQ. So come and check me out. 
Okay. Well, thank you, Asha. This is a thank wonderful you. conversation. Yeah, thanks.